when I came out, um, I remember going into the LGBT community and thinking I should be feeling at home in that place. And I didn't. I was not made to feel welcome. When you're in that position, you think, oh, I've got to come out to my kids. How do I do that? <laughs> um, this doesn't feel right. You know, um, because you, you think, again, you think that you're the only gay or bisexual dad in the world. Um, um, and it can be quite just as, um, you know, just as um, sort of thing, what I used to think are, oh, can be the only gay or bisexual man, thick man in the world. Um, you know, it's the same thing when it comes to fatherhood as well. Please stop all this woke agenda. It's political correctness gone mad. Sorry, thought police. You're such a snowflake. Surely all lives matter. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> Did those sound familiar? Here on You Can't Say Anything Anymore, we unpack the nuances of these comments and bring sidelined lived experiences to the forefront. Brought to you by Diversifying Group. Hi everyone, welcome to this month's podcast. I'm your podcast host, my name is Naomi. My pronouns are she and they. And this month we've got a very special guest. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Hello, my name's uh, Prip Habula. Um, so my pronouns are he, him, um, and I'm a Sikh man who is just going to talk about some of the stuff I do within the LGBT community as a bisexual man. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Yeah, I saw your profile on, um, I think it was one of the, uh, the Instagram posts that I saw, and um, it was about sort of see your work um, in with Sabat and with obviously about the LGBTQ plus community, which I thought was super interesting. And um, yeah, if you could just outline for our listeners, but you know, what kind of is the Sikh LGBTQ plus community like, and how did you become involved with this community? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, the Sikh community generally is a fairly small community. Um, so, in terms of numbers, there's about twenty-five to thirty million Sikhs around the world. Um, so, that's a, a fairly small number. Um, and um, when you're then obviously looking at well, how many of those are LGBTQ plus? that's an even smaller proportion. So you're already a small community, a minority, and then within that, you're also another minority community. So um, it's quite a dispersed community. Um, I came across uh, Sarbat as a, a virtual community. Um, so it's a, a Sikh LGBT um, a group who um, provide um, uh, you know, resor resources and support to people who happen to um, either be Sikh or LGBT and LGBTQ plus, or happen to have some sort of other interest that links them in with either one of those um, characteristics, I guess. Yeah, amazing. I don't know if you could share a bit about your kind of experiences with um, within those groups at all. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so as a as a, as a as a community group, um, Sarbat is something which um, provides a lot of support to. Um, to people who already feel fairly alienated, because as I say, we're uh, being a minority group already, um, being, uh, you know, having visible identities of faith, such as my turban and my beard, you know, we stand out. Um, but also, um, you know, generally, we probably don't fit the sort of stereotype that you'd expect for, of an LGBT plus Q-class person, if there is such a stereotype, but certainly, um, you know, one of the things that you, you do find is that you you, you do stand out um, for many reasons, it, um, and it could be the for the religious or the ethnic backgrounds, um, and and in the certainly in the LGBT community, when I came out, um, I remember going into the LGBT community and thinking I should be feeling at home in that place, and I didn't. I was not made to feel welcome. Um, I felt quite alienated. So being able to join a group like Sarbat helps because it helps you communicate with and connect with other people who look like me, um, but also happen to maybe understand a bit more my experience. Um, but also might share some of the same experiences that or similar experiences that I've had in my life. So from that point of view, it's a really good place to be able to connect with other people um, across the globe who um, happen to share you know, religious philosophy, but also the similar community experiences as well. Yeah, I can imagine, obviously, when we spoke before in sort of pre-podcast as well, we were talking about the kind of difficulties with the intersecting relationship between faith and religion and then LGBTQ plus communities. And, and I think that, you know, you just spoke about it here is that this is some place where you expected to feel at home, but you didn't for various reasons. I don't know if you have any kind of 
more reflections about you know any more experiences about um I guess that kind of um how to say there does seem to be a big divide um within lgbtq plus communities and um the concept of faith because i for various reasons and many of them have been uh, um first-hand experiences of injustices you know for, for the for those individuals you know you know perpetuated by certain religious individuals and things yeah i mean i, th I think it's quite accepted that very many faiths have done a lot of harm to LGBT plus people. Okay, so I, I set that out at the beginning um, and lay it out there because it's true. You know, we need to start off at that position. A lot of LGBTQ plus people, therefore, um, that I have come across have therefore had either hostility or reluctance to engage with people who might be involved with religion. Um, but equally, when I've been doing my LGBTQ plus work in the interfaith space, I've met people, for example, who are Christians, who have said that they found it harder to come out as Christian within the LGBT community than they have um, as being LGBTQ plus in the first place. Um, so it's, it's it's a bit of a par paradox there when you're looking at this, because, you know, we, we talk about the coming out of somebody, uh, you know, which, we, you know, as LGBTQ plus people, we all come out, yeah, come out at some point. To, first to ourselves and then to other people um and then it's just it, it's just strange that we then as a personal faith have to do the same within a within the lgbtq plus community but obviously i can't hide it so my mere presence with somebody shows them that i have a faith identity so it so although other people can maybe hide their religious beliefs uh, which people have said they have had to do i can't do that so, um, you know, so again, the key, the key thing is, well, um, and a good, and good thing about technology these days is that if you can't find a community that you can connect with, we can create our own communities. And actually, uh, by, uh, you know, connecting with other like minded people, not just of the Sikh faith, but lots of other backgrounds as well, religious and non-religious, um, you know, I found some beautiful communities and some amazing people that I've been working with it, to, to try and work in this space so that we can make it easier for people to be um, whoever they are, but also have their faith as well and not have to hide it. Uh, and so that people can be comfortable, but equally trying to get people who are from the mainstream straight communities to understand the harm that they have done or their faith or the faiths have done to people from the LGBT community. Um, and how 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 they can maybe start welcoming those of us that want to go into faith communities and work with faith communities and be part of those communities. How they can well open open their arms and welcome us back. Um, I mean, we still are hearing horrific stories of children who are committing suicide because they find that they cannot be of the faith background that they are and and their their LGBTQ plus identity. In the UK, and this, you know, in 2022, this is unacceptable, and it must stop. It is really awful, isn't it, to think about how much pain there is in people feeling that they have to rip apart those parts of themselves, which are parts of the same thing, which are all parts of them and their history and their story and their background. You know, as I mentioned about how culture and religion often tie in together, and the history and its sort of intertwinedness about that. And to think that people feel as if that their whole self cannot be, you know, does not compute, you know, it cannot be, cannot exist together. I think that's, as, 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 I think it's really awful. And I, it's, um, you know, I liked that you mentioned about the responsibility of the sort of the straight faith community and what they have towards other people of faith and LGBTQ people of faith specifically to, to welcoming them. Yeah, absolutely, and we're we're still seeing these fights that are going on really within within religious institutions. I mean, the Anglican Communion have um, recently had um, the Lambeth Conference, which is a, a really big thing in the sort of the, the Anglican Communion around. Uh, sort of takes place every I think ten or twelve years, um, and again, you know, there, there was a huge fight over LGBTQ plus rights. Um, there was a possible, you know, there was the potential there for uh, rolling back uh, on um, same-sex marriages that are taking place in some of these community, uh, community. Um, and I can't believe that we are going backwards rather than having conversations around, around affirming people of religion to be accepted for who they are 
Um, you know, so this is a real battle that we have to face. And that's why, for me, it's really important that we come together as people of faith to support one another, um, because there are there are many allies within the faith communities as well. Um, so I say thank you very much for your allyship. Um, but but it's um, you know it shouldn't be left just to those of that faith to fight on their own. We need to fight one another's battles and support one another. Just as um, trans people's rights are being trampled on these days, um, you know we need to stand um, shoulder to shoulder along with our trans um, our community, um, you know, friends and family and um, show solidarity with them as well so that they, they are accepted for who they are and their rights aren't, um, you know, aren't um, taken away either. Um, you know, and that then takes us on to other issues around conversion therapy um, and how it's accepted it is abusive, but yeah, we still can't get a ban in place. Um, you know, or if we do get a ban in place, then we're, you know, we're gonna allow that abuse to still carry on for trans people, which doesn't make any sense. It's, if it's abusive to one human being, it's abusive to all. So let's just ban it for everybody. Um, you know, let's make sure protections are there for all people. Um, so I think these are conversations that are really important um, and we need to have solidarity, we need to work together. And even those um, you know, people within the LGBT community who don't have a belief, a belief or a faith in God, um, you know, that showing allyship to us is important uh, because the, the as, as a person of faith and being LGBTQ plus, I cannot separate my sexual orientation from my my being as just as I cannot I cannot stop my beliefs in my or whatever they are you know um, they are what they are and I believe what I believe and I shouldn't have to choose no I shouldn't have to say okay well I'll deny who I am to be religious and I'll pretend to be straight or um, you know I oh, I'll give up my faith just so I can be who I am why should we be denied any part of our, 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 our identity? No, I, I love that you put it like that. And I think that the idea that we need to support everybody and everybody needs to unite, for, I think that's, you know, fantastic. And the fact that you said that, why do you have to deny bits of yourself to, to fit into something, to be a part of something when really all of them are part of you? I guess this kind of rolls into my kind of next question and you've spoken about it a bit as well. But, um, you know, what would you say are some of the challenges that you faced with all these different interse intersecting identities, you know, as a, you identify as a bisexual man, you know, as a person of faith, and you know as well that um, you, you also identify as a, as a father as well. So I, I just, just wondered what your kind of viewpoint was about the challenges of all of these intersecting identities and where many people perhaps believe that these don't, these can't coexist. Yeah, so it's interesting, really, when you talk about the intersection of all these different identities. So as a father of two daughters, um, people just expect me to be straight. Looking at me as a man of faith with a turban and looking at the way I do, people just expect me to be straight. Um, you know, so there's all these perceptions that people have. Then, as I say, when I'm in the LGBTQ plus community, people, um, you know, sort of like, oh, why are you here? You don't fit in with us sort of thing. Um, you know, and then and then having to come out is is quite challenging. And I remember actually when my children were younger, uh, around my worries around having to come out to their uh, not the children, their friends necessarily, my children's friends, but really their parents. I found that quite a struggle personally. Um, you know, because when you're younger, when our kids are younger, uh, you spend a lot of time in sort of um, you know with the with the parents of of their friends and stuff. And, um, you know, some of them, you know, well, which is fine because they're friendship, but others you might have ad hoc relationships with where you sort of um, you know, bump into them. Now, ordinarily, I don't really see why I should have to come out to anybody that I don't want to. But equally, it's a bit awkward when sometimes they're asking about, you know, oh, uh, who should, you know, which partner or whatever, like, you know, when I, and then you've got to sort of come out with it. Um, and it's like, do I, the worry, the worry that I had when my girls were younger was around, does this mean if I was to come out to this parent who I don't really know very well, that my children might be denied access to one of their friendship groups? Um, and it, and that's where you're coming from. So you need, you, I think it's really, so for me, it was really important to be able to understand that my children were in a place where they were happy about who I am. Uh, and to be honest, um, yeah, they've always been my biggest allies as well. Um, and when I knew that actually, 
you know, their, their love for me as their father is more important than the fact that somebody might think bad of them because of who I happen to love. Um, that was quite empowering, actually. Um, what I what I did do when I was at the end as well was um, signed up with a charity called Diversity Role Models. And um, what I did with them was I, I went into schools um, um, with this charity as a volunteer to support them to uh, give LGBT inclusion um, education to children um, of all ages, from four, four years old all the way up to 18. Um, and this was a really good way of me learning different approaches and styles, depending on ages of um, you know, my, my children and their friends, to be able to share the you know, information around, around my sex orientation and how to do it. Um, so it's a bit, it was a, a really, um, it was a really powerful tool to be able to support me with the upbringing of my children to make sure that they are um, um, given the right information because just because you come out doesn't mean that you actually know what all these different identities mean. I mean, I knew I think, for example, about trans experience or trans people, you know, I only knew what my own experience was that um, as someone who lived life of a straight man happened and then happened to, you know, have attractions to men as well um, and, uh, and accept it when I stopped denying that sort of that. So I could only share my experience. But actually going through this, I was working with lots of other volunteers, hearing their stories and experiences as well. And again, that really, um, hearing, I think hearing about all these experiences people were going through made me realise that there's a lot more work that we need to do in the community to be able to make sure that when children grow up, they can just grow up as themselves without having to hide who they are, without having to pretend, and without having to um, fit in to please other people, just to be accepted and loved for who they are. I found that, you know, it was a lot, there's a lot of work to do. So, so hence why working in the various sort of um, different places that I've had interest in, such as religion, um, such as, uh, you know, for uh, gay, gay and bisexual dads, um, these are really important communities for me to be able to work within, to try and make life a little bit better for somebody else. I think that's really amazing that you said that your kids are your, your kind of biggest supporters. And I, I think that's, it kind of speaks to the pure nature of things that kids, you know, we don't, I know, I know this has been, you know, it's an old, old book we've all been saying for ages, but what well, many of us have been, it's, um, you know, kids, they don't, they don't, you know, they don't know any hate when they start off, do they? They just, you know, you're their dad and they love you, you know, yeah. that, that's, that's it. They don't, they don't think, you know, they don't not conscious all the time of, oh, my dad is, you know, whatever identity. And I think that it it's it's it really is as simple as that. And I think I think I think the biggest challenge is though mm. not not necessarily it's maybe not that the love point. It might actually just be around. Well, actually, how do I make sure that kids have full facts so that when somebody was to challenge them, they are able to respond confidently without feeling belittled. Um, and I think that that's where it's really important because if if you think about many people who. Um, you know, even if I think of my own personal experience, when I was growing up, I didn't know anybody who was LGBT plus, you know, it just, you know, so I thought. Um, and because it wasn't talked about, Section 24 was in place, which meant it was illegal for it to be taught in schools or anyone to um, talk about it. So, um, you know, so it's a very, so we didn't even know, I didn't even know, you know, so I had to learn all this stuff. Um, and it's about making sure that we can also help other people understand that it's all about either you know, um, accepting yourself for who you are, whether it's in relation to um, attraction to another person or whether it's to do with your gender identity or gender expression, you know, um, it's all about accepting yourself for who you are. But it's about trying to explain this to people who don't understand that experience that probably LGBT plus people go through um, just so they understand, actually, we haven't changed. The person we are now coming out to you as, you should love because this is the real me. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I was, I was going to be my next question was about your, your work in schools, but you've already um, given us a great summary about that. And I think that, I mean, do you think that then the, the kind of key takeaway from this is about the lived experience, the fact that you heard these people's stories and that was kind of how you got to, got to know more about different people from, from the wider LGBTQ plus community? Yeah, absolutely. So lived experience, I think, works for everybody because we have all had a different experience regardless of what our characteristics are they you know straight um lgbt plus um 
no, from an ethnic minority, from the mainstream community, you know, everybody has their own story. We need to listen to one another's stories because um, we learn by listening to other people. Uh, by telling our story, it can also actually be quite healing as well, by being able to share that with other people, by being able to tell other people. It can, um, I find it a way that it does, um, in a way, um, has healed some of those um, wounds that I've probably created um, for myself as somebody who had to deny who I was because, you know, I didn't think, um, you know, I would be accepted by by society, family, community, friends, whoever. Yes, I, go, I guess I was going to ask about kind of speaking to, because um, obviously I can only speak from my experience as well and things, and, you know, I identify as, as pansexual, for example, and I think that there's something as well about what I've heard from a lot of other people um, who identify as, as bi or as pansexual, you know, it's, it's almost that kind of, um, I don't know, do you think that there is something in the, the sense that because attraction to uh, two or more genders is, is something as well that is also kind of stigmatized? It's the idea that, that you need to pick one thing or one one gender to be attracted to, which, which in itself is a very archaic way of looking at things um yeah i mean at the end of the day uh, i think that fa- that saying love is love that uh, we sort of all go on about in, during pride month is 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 the point you know love is you fall in love with whoever you fall in love with it shouldn't really matter so we in an ideal world we shouldn't have to put a label on anything and we should just accept people you know to you know that somebody loves somebody else we should celebrate that it's beautiful you know it shouldn't matter what the label reads Unfortunately, um, you know, we, we do need to talk about these labels so that because the problem is that the LGBTQ plus community have been marginalized, are still marginalized, and we need to, um, you know, get that uh, normalization, acceptance of everybody for who they are. So, yeah, I, I, my aspiration is that I never have to do any of this charity work again because we will just accept people for who they are. And there will be no need to go and sort of say, oh, hi, I'm Britpal, I'm bisexual, you know, um, this is what it means, because people just go, oh, there's Britpal, he's in love with whoever, and it's beautiful. And that's what we need, to, that's when, where we need to just stop it, you know, and just celebrate that, uh, you know, love is a beautiful thing, um, and there's two concerning adults who are in a beautiful, loving relationship, that's amazing. Yeah, we can get into the more interesting things like what your favorite food is and what music you Absolutely. Do. And disagree on <laughs> politics and all those other things that we disagree exactly. about. But <laughs> let's exactly. let's let's just accept one another for who we are. Exactly. I think that who you're dating or who you're attracted to is probably, you know, for many times sometimes the least interesting thing about, you know, with the person really. It's, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Doesn't really say much about the kind of conversations that you're really going to have. <laughs> yeah. So. No, absolutely things um but yeah I guess I wanted to move on to ask a bit about um you've spoken a bit as well about sort of parenthood and things and I know you've done some work with the other podcasts um about sort of like LGBTQ parenting and things and you know what does it mean to you then to be in this kind of space and um, I know you mentioned before as well that um being a very visual sorry being a very visible not only minority but a visible person of faith as well um so (laughs) occupying all of these spaces but also being within the lgbtq fatherhood space as well i mean yeah i wanted to ask you about your experiences with that yeah i could talk about that so so just to give some context so i had my children in a straight relationship um and after that relationship came to an end i came out so um so it's really odd because when you're in that position you think oh I've got to come out to my kids. How do I do that? <laughs> um, this doesn't feel right, you know, um, because you, you think, again, you think that you're the only gay or bisexual dad in the world. Um, um, and it can be quite just as, um, you know, just as um, sort of thing, what I used to think are, oh, can be the only gay or bisexual man, thick man in the world. Um, you know, it's the same thing when it comes to fatherhood as well. Uh, I thought I was the only man in this situation, but actually I was really lucky because um, I came across a, a, an amazing community of gay dads. Um, and there's loads of them, there's thousands of them out there who are men in a similar situation to me where they've been in a straight relationship. Um, some of them, their partners knew, some of them they didn't know, some of them didn't know themselves until their relationships going to an end. You know, there's a whole mixture of stories in that space as well. Um, so, so it's an amazing community where um, we've got dads who support one another, um, who happen to either be going through a 
crisis of realizing at some point that they are attracted to men or they have separated or divorced and from and they have kids and they they are um, you know coming coming new into the the gay or gay LGBTQ plus world um, um, obviously but they're coming in as, as fathers so um, you know so so it's a great community where we um, you know support one another share stories again um, provide or um, you know, discuss parenting challenges that we all have with our teenagers. <laughs> you know, um, and and there's been some people who've gone off and got married within that community as well. So so what we've within that community, what we've managed to do is start being, building some resources. So um, you know, by bringing our skills together. So one of the gay dads um, in my community, for example, was writer. So he went off and published a book called Gay Dad. And it's the story of 10 of the dads uh, compiled. So please do uh, go onto Amazon and buy a copy and have a read. It's amazing. Um, another um, gay dad was a journalist and, um, and a, write, a, a sort of script writer. He's put together a podcast called Rainbow Dads, which has had two series that have come out. So um, yeah, go out and have a look at that as well. Have a listen to that. Um, it's an, it's an award-winning podcast as well. Um, so um, it's won several awards, um, so and, and we've connected with lots of other communities around around the world again, or people who are in similar positions but might not have um, any support networks. Um, so you know, we um, or we've linked up with other organisations to to provide input into father fathering issues. And the world of um, gay parenting is changing now, anyway, because I just remember where in the past very many men of my my age who happened to be gay um, were sort of men who didn't ever expect to have children because they they were you know it wasn't allowed they couldn't adopt they couldn't foster and all these sorts of things so that for them they just never contemplated it well these days obviously because it's equality is, exists in in parenting as well we've had uh, you know we do have lots of um lots of young young men and women in same-sex partnerships who are looking at loads of different ways of going and creating their families, whether it's through fostering or adoption or through surrogacy. There's so many different routes that they can use. Um, so yeah, so there's um, yeah, lots of people coming into this, um, into our community now who have lots of varied experiences of um, you know, how they've had their children um, and how they've got their family. Um, and it's amazing. And so when, when we're doing the work with diversity role models a lot of the stuff we do particularly with the younger children is all about talking about diverse families so you know families who could be uh, from um, two straight couples that have got families before that come together it could be two, you know um, two men that come together it could be two women that come together and have a family you know um, it could be more you know multiple generations you know some people might have two or three generations of people living in their household as well. So there's different types of families, diverse families, and it's about how we celebrate it. And just don't expect everybody to have, you know, um, a mum, dad, and two children. The ultimate nuclear family. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's about how, how a modern family looks, which is uh, many different, you know, there's not one way of describing it. There's lots of different ways and it's, you know, however it suits people. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, all of those those resources going great. I guess I think that in some ways as well, one of the what I guess would be one of some of the biggest challenges is that, as you mentioned, that this is kind of essentially, you know, LGBTQ parenthood is kind of a new thing because previously it's been not allowed. So although many people have been, you know, fantastic uncles or sort of um, step parents in, in a sense, but many people weren't allowed to have families before. So I guess that the the resources and challenges are just starting to be written would you say that that was kind of a part of it as well yeah so there's um a lot more information available out there um there are still challenges in that space because obviously legislation hasn't caught up with the reality of the lives that people are living so for example um you know if you go and have your children in a particular jurisdiction do you have to get a visa to bring them back again and how do you get their names on the birth certificates and all those sorts of things so different countries have different regulations and as to how it all works out um and and the other the other thing as well is it's very expensive um so unless you are we went off surrogacy for example is really difficult but when when people do come sort of to talk about parenting the advice i give them is well if you're going to spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on surrogacy would you not rather spend that money on maybe giving a home to a child 
who, who might need one. So there are plenty of children who we can probably um, already in the world who could do with um, some love, um, you know, um, and some parents uh, you know, who will give them all the things that all children deserve, um, you know, all those cuddles and uh, those sorts of things. So, you know, uh, so yeah, fostering and adoption are great alternatives for uh, many people too. Um, yeah, but some people, it's it's funny because some people sort of say, oh, but I really want to have a genetic link because I feel like I need one. And it's like, well, uh, that doesn't really alter the way that your child will be. They will love you. They should love you for who you are, even if you've got a genetic link sometimes, you know, your, your children, you might have issues and think, ah, damn, you know, uh, my children are, are doing this or doing that. Or, you know, so I think we just got to look at kids as being, you know, uh, individuals that they are and love them for who they are. And, um, you know, that I don't necessarily think a genetic link um, is more powerful. The most important thing is giving them love um, and cuddles and all those lovely things that kids, you know, kids, kids need. Um, yeah, so to be able to provide them with that home and a secure, uh, home security and education and all these sorts of things are far more important. Okay, you heard it here, people. Kids need cuddles and love. That's that's the secret. Yeah, <laughs> that's the secret absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. I think um, I actually saw something which kind of speaks to what we were talking about here. Is um, a study? I think it was by the oh. I can't remember the exact name, but it's um, it's one of the big top five uh, world, inst- you know, universities, institutions. I think it might be in the Hague, actually. I can't remember, but um, I'll look that up later. But it was saying how actually they did a giant study and it turns out that um, kids from um, LGBTQ families do better at school. And the sort of main factors behind that were, of course, the fact that there's sort of um, many people who've had families who are you know, LGBTQ. Yes, it, there is a wealth element in that. They, you know, they do have to have a lot of money to have potentially, like you said, surrogates, or many people need um, different cycles of IVF and things like that. Um, but also that all of those kids are wanted. They are all, you know, deeply cherished and looked after. And you know, I know it sounds very simple, doesn't it? Sort of, you know. Having financial gains yeah, and but, being wanted is. But, but there, but there are other statistics as well, which support. So, for example, if you compare um, straight marriages that, um, that end in divorce versus LGBTQ plus marriages that end in divorce, the, the divorce rates for same-sex partners are far lower than they are for um, heterosexual couples. So, That's really interesting. Well, yes, do you, do you that, have to know why that is. I don't know, but the point the point is, I, I make this point with all the um, all the people that sort of say you know, marriage is a great thing. Um, it should be between a man and a woman. And I'll say, it's such a great thing that it quite often doesn't work. So <laughs> they end up getting divorced. So that's surely not a good thing. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, at the end of so yeah, so it's, um, yeah, I use that as my little backup line for those people who sort of say, it should be between a man and a woman because it's, that's what it says. And I say, well, no, um, because if it ends up in divorce, then it's not a good thing necessarily, is it? might be but it might not be so uh, yeah so so uh, but again that might help you know, if you look at you, the information you were sort of talking about in terms of lgbtq plus parenting that there could be other factors such as this uh, you know which provide extra stability for the children um so i don't know without looking into it it's not not an area i've looked into but yeah certainly very interesting um i guess kind of wanted to move on as well to speak about um how do you think being an lgbtq parent has impacted your experience within the wider LGBTQ community, because obviously you've spoken a lot about your interactions with all the other sort of um, sort of LGBTQ dads and things like that. Um, but do you think that there is any kind of um, difference in experience between that and then being an LGBTQ member of the LGBTQ plus community, say without kids, for example? Yeah. So I mean, again, I can only go by my own experience and uh, and obviously um, my my age as well so you know men so in my experience with men of my own age um it seems that um having children is either a turn off quite often um rather than something that's a, a positive thing that's seen by uh, by some people um so you know again as we talked about before some people find religion a big turn off as well um you know, there are some people who find oh you know um a man with, with children um a turn off as well and they go oh, no i don't you know i don't want to have anything to do with with it but i mean that's from a, a dad's point of view the point the point is if somebody's going to turn around and, and react in that way towards you, children that's a big sign that it would not be a good relationship anyway so move on fast <laughs> save yourself the hassle 
run for the hills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because you know your your kids should never be a negotiating tool at all. Um, so, so there, so there are, so there are again some people who have low prejudices. Uh, you know, and it could just be because, again, so many people when they've had to come out in the past have had to sort of scrub the right the idea or thought of ever being able to have a family or have children. Um, but again, they find it quite difficult, I think, sometimes to accept um, uh, um, you know, dating a man or, or being with another man who happens to have children. Um, so that in itself can be um, sometimes quite a challenging perspective. Um, but generally, um, and there's so many people now uh, who do have children who are in same-sex relationships um, that, you know, even if you go to Pride, for example, in the past, it would be very much an adult-focused thing. These days, when you go to Pride events and stuff, they tend to have Pride for different different types of people, so different ages. Um, you know, so they do have sort of family areas, and you even actually have family sections marching in Pride as well. Um, so yeah, so it's it's as a community, you know, we were all too diverse to start with, and it's getting even more diverse. And um, it's great to be able to see that um, you know LGBTQ plus people. Um, and their families are being accepted more and more into, uh, you know, the events that take place um, within within that community too. Yeah, I love that. I love that you said that it was it was already diverse anyway, and then it just it's just getting more and more diverse. Uh, I think that's yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess we need to just move on to ask about kind of what sport it's a bit sport. I <laughs> see that on this stuff um what support if any you know have you have you experienced throughout your whole journey with this so so through my lgbt club through through, through trying to come to um sort of understanding my 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 journey as a bisexual man um i mean i first i grew up as a straight man then i came out as gay and then i decided i was bisexual because i was attracted to women as well and, I, and and the thing is the difficulty is that nobody tells you what you are uh, you just know that you're attracted to say whoever you're attracted to so um and i don't know again if when i was younger if um, my attraction more to women um, or girls was because um, i lived in a heteronormative world i don't know that but i just know that at the time it was stronger for women than it is now um and um you know so so one of the things that we need to be able to do is just understand you know who who we are um and um, and embrace our authenticity from a younger age as possible because so many young people sort of try and do things to please other people if i was to talk to my younger self i would say put yourself first because you'll never please other people <laughs> and so i think so i think so you know from a support perspective people should understand that uh, you know, you need to be able to help yourself um, as well as, as be able to get help from other people. Um, so that's a, a great starting point. Um, for any young people or any people who aren't sure about, um, you know, or have any questions or are confused about any of these topics that we're talking about, um, a great resource um, is Switchboard, uh, which is a charity where they have volunteers who are trained up and you can talk to them. Um, and uh, if they can't help you with the issue you've got, they'll be able to read your call or, or or put you in touch with people who can can get in touch. So again, it's a, a great um, form of support. Um, there's lots of information available on the internet these days and lots of groups. So, um, you know, just if you were to go along and Google something and, and have a look for support groups in your local area, there are people, there are so many different support groups. Um, particularly people who happen to be LGBTQ plus and of a faith. Um, you know, there are lots and lots of um, faith groups who are affirming, who are welcoming of all people. Um, you know, I mean, I've worked, I walked past a, a church in Windsor a few weeks ago and, you know, it, and it had a sign which basically said, you know, um, we welcome, and it said, um, all people, uh, regardless of religion, regardless of your sexual orientation, regardless of your gender identity, Everybody is welcome here. Uh, yes, so there are so many people out there, so many um, community, so many people you can get in touch with. Um, so you know, do do reach out and look for look for support, um, because there's so many so many good charities out there or groups 
community groups that can help um, give you, let's say if you can't find a community that accepts you, um, create that community yourself um, and you will attract loads of people like-minded who will then be able to um, you know, start doing some amazing stuff with you. That's fantastic. I mean, there's, there were so many great resources there. Um, I guess I was just going to ask about what would have meant to sort of younger Pritpal if you had been the recipient of, of, of you know, seeing someone like yourself um, if, with the work you do with diverse role models in school? So um, I, th I guess uh, if, if I could see people um, like me when I was younger, I guess it would have cut out a lot of heartache, I hope. Um, because I would have just been able to have maybe at a younger age been able to have maybe reflected and embraced who I was. Um, the challenge you sometimes have, though, again, is living in a uh, living as an ethnic minority in the UK. Um, you know, it sometimes there's another layer because um, you know I grew up within a a, a family who um, were from a different cultural background. Um, you know, my family have been here for four four generations, but you know, we at home we were sort of Sikhs and you know, a part of an Indian what an Indian community, um, and you know you've so you've got various layers that you need to peel off then to be able to embrace who you are because uh, you know so so it's a case of um, you know just try and try and understand who you are accept who you are for who you are don't ex don't ex don't just go by other people's expectations of you know you have to be a, a doctor for example would be a normal thing in an Asian family. Um, because we're all meant to be doctors and I wanted to go off and do a degree in French and German and I was actually really lucky because my mum was very supportive of, of that and um, you know I was able to do what I wanted to do she said do what you're good at so I did and um, I'm really lucky but you know lots of people get uh, under so many influences of do this and do that depending on you know, your family dy dynamics and stuff and sometimes there's also the unseen pressure of other people oh look what other people's children are doing <laughs> so, <laughs> and aunties, I've the my, Asian aunties. Yeah, absolutely. There. And I've always just said to my, I've always said to my kids that just do what you're happy with, uh, ignore what other people are doing. You know, um, just as long as you are not doing what I was doing, which is um, about 16, which is working in Tesco so on the checkout. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was also no way. I was 18. I was working at co-op. You see, so. <laughs> okay, yeah, slightly out market there. <laughs> Better me. Barely. barely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's quite funny I guess um actually one of the things that just popped into my head actually just um before we kind of come to a close was um obviously you mentioned the kind of wider Asian community you don't I, um what kind of popped into my head was there's not only these pressures about sort of the Asian community with uh, you know as well but there's also sort of your specific religion as well and all, all of these kind of like compiling down I don't know what you what your thoughts are on that if you'd say that they is it, is it this case of that for you they're completely indistinguishable that they they both combine together to kind of um which molded your experience of this sort of very heteronormative world or would you say that your experiences of those have been different with different layers um i think the experience has been different with different layers so when i for example from a Sikh perspective when i've gone out to to find out about am i accepted as a as a bisexual man or a gay man in in, in the Sikh faith the response has been undoubtedly, yeah, of course you are, because you're created by God and we love all people for who they are. Um, so that that's the theology. So I'm actually quite lucky and fortunate because we don't have a, um, you know, a, nar a theological narrative, which is a, a barrier to me being who I am from a religious perspective. But then equally, um, you know, the, um, there are there are other challenges, which is around, um, well, that might be the theological view, but it doesn't mean that society necessarily goes along with that as well, because um, you know society operate the way they want. They they'll use whatever excuses they want to to um, be able to um, you know, tarnish people. So it doesn't mean I don't face prejudice. So so you have these. So I think it becomes more challenging because obviously as a growing up in a, within an Asian community and um, within an ethnic minority group, that community is quite small and becomes quite um, you know, it's quite important part of your your life and, and everybody's families are connected through it and you know a lot of your acquaintances are made through it and then you think well you know potentially that's all going to go for me you know and you can lose all of that so you've it's, so it's so it's a challenge and well, okay I'm going to get rejected by all of that 
and then you turn up in an LGBT community and then they don't accept you because of your you're from an ethnic minority or for, you're from a religious background or whatever it might be and then you know and so it gets even more hard and more difficult because you're struggling to find somewhere where you fit in I think which is why I think from which is why I've said you know we need to create our own communities because the more of these communities we can create hopefully we'll be able to bring it together all those people that are loving and accepting um, and attract them and hopefully create our own more powerful enduring uh, future focused communities um, and those ones that rejected us or reject you know intend to reject us um, will hopefully fizzle away uh, and not exist in the future yeah I think that's kind of speaks to what you were speaking about earlier which was that you felt that in this whole experience you thought oh my god am I going to be the only sort of like seek dad in you know in a same-sex relationship in in the world like you know the fact that is that you know there's definitely you're definitely not you know but it's this sort of um feeling I guess of isolation and the feeling of um the kind of alienation from from the many groups of which you belong in but when I speak to so it's when I still speak to young Sikh people in the UK um you know who reach out for support they still are scared they still won't come out they still won't uh, aren't prepared to um you know uh, tell people who they really are um so they, those fears still exist for people um and and I, I guess over time and with age and experience you know, they will be able to do that in their own time because there's no right time but nobody should be nobody should fear having to come out to another person um and it feels as though there is and i think a lot of that fear comes from uh potentially from rejection um some of it can also come from places of um, fear of violence and and other social stigmatization as well so um yeah so there's um you know so there's a lot of work we need to do still to be able to provide um you know a, a supportive environment for people who are in that in that space where they don't feel that where they feel rejected by everybody and they need to find somebody they can connect connect with yeah that's absolutely fantastic um, i love how you put that together and the fact that you kind of outlined outlined all the different challenges that you have with all the different layers of your identity and and you know the, I think you kind of put across very well as well for many people that um, I guess perhaps don't see the challenges that many um, LGBTQ plus people of color face the fact that many of their communities are built around all of these structures and um, they, they stand to, to lose all of those things potentially um, yeah yeah my takeaway would just be around um, for anybody listening to this, if you're um, an ally, uh, you know, just uh, reach out to people, listen to their stories, listen to their experience, um, um, and, uh, you know, just accept them for who they are. Don't judge. Um, that's really important. Um, if it's anybody who feels like they're being rejected or alienated for any specific reason, um, don't fear. Um, you know, just be who you are, because those people that are trying to make you be something else, um, will never accept you, even if you pander to all of their expectations. Um, so it's better not just to give, you know, to give up before you even start get, sort of going down that way, down that road, um, and say that this is who I am. Um, and it's easy for me to say, as a 45 year old man talking here, it's easy for me to say, but, um, you know, I just want to see people who, who might be younger and or more of a vulnerable position. Um, it's not necessarily always easy, um, but, I, but I always say to people, life's not easy. <laughs> there are challenges. Um, and you just got to sometimes, you know, just it's much harder if you can't accept yourself for who you are um, than to unpick it all um, and, and to start again. Then just start embracing who you are um, and, and making sure that you can just be, you know, be the wonderful you that you're meant to be. Um, and um, people will love you for who you are if, they're impor if they are important to you. Um, and if they don't, then they shouldn't be important to you. Yeah, I think that the, I think I heard something, something kind of similar was saying that if the truth breaks a relationship, then it probably wasn't a relationship worth keeping. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah. But, um, thank you so much for being on today's episode. Um, is there any sort of um, links or things that you'd like to plug or, you know, any any. Yeah, so um, so as a diversity role models, um, great. Um, you know, if you Google them, they're a great um, charity. Always looking for volunteers uh, who can give their time to support them. But also, if you can fund them, then that's even better. So do consider um, 
you know, donating to them if you can. Um, again, Sarbra is a charity which does great work for um, LGBT Sikh uh, people. So, you know, um, if you are interested in reaching out to them, um, you know, again, uh, www.sarbra.net um, is a website for them. Um, and if you're a gay dad, then do grab the pod Rainbow, uh, have listened to the Rainbow Dads podcast or grab the Gay Dad book. Um, and, um, you know, and from there, you'll be signposted on into the, the gay dad or bisexual dad community. Uh, we call ourselves GADs for short. I love that. <laughs> 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 so cool. Oh, thank you so much again for being on this episode. You're most welcome. It was great talking to you. Great. Well, thank you all to our listeners, and we'll speak to you all in the next episode. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support this podcast, please share it with others and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Keep up to date with what we do at Diversifying Group at diversifying.com or follow us on social media at Diversifying Group. See you next time.